Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 9 2016 NFL predictions. Well, this week for the fanatic, this was a, this has been a very good week, probably for the first time all year. Uh, for both my against the spread and straight up picks, I will be above 500. Um, so this week so far against the spread, I am six five and one, and straight up I am seven four and one. So hey, that's pretty good for the first time all year. Both uh, both uh, sets of picks, I should be able to get at least uh, above five hundred or five hundred or better. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, though now overall for the year uh, against the spread, I am now forty eight sixty three and five, which is about forty three percent. So. I still have time. I still about we're about the halfway point for the NFL year. I want to get up to about 500 against the spread. That'd be a, a very good goal for me to have. Um, do I think I can achieve it? Yes, but I, I need to start uh, stringing some winning weeks against the spread together. So hope, guys, hope for me that I can do that. But uh, we will see. And now overall, uh, straight up for the year, I am 67, 50, and two. So right now, so I'm at 57 percent. So. I'm still going on that good track of getting to about 60% straight up by the end of the year uh, at this point. What a wild week nine in the NFL. Um, from what I have seen uh, from all the games this weekend, just in the NFL in general, there's really, first of all, only one team in the AFC that should get to the Super Bowl at this point. That is the New England Patriots. They are by far the best team overall. Uh, in terms of consistency, in terms of yardage, in terms of points, in terms of defense. You know, again, I, I would say that their red zone defense and their defense is their weakest point. And they just traded uh, their uh, very good linebacker, Jamie Collins, of the Cleveland Browns, for a, com uh, com a, co a compensatory third-round pick that uh, could end up being a fourth-round pick if... Uh, or it could end up being a fourth-round pick. I don't know exactly what the situation is. But I did find out that apparently Jamie Collins thought uh, he was worth Von Miller money. Jamie Collins is a very good linebacker, but he is no Von Miller. So now I understand why the, the uh, Pats wanted, or the Pats were willing to trade him away, because they just wanted to get a pick before they had to deal with either not getting him or just letting him go and not getting something in return. Uh, but New England is the best team in the uh, AFC. Tom Brady, 12 touchdowns, 73% completions, no interceptions, about 1,300 yards passing playing the best of his career at this point. Um, the defense, they held Tyrod Taylor to 50% completion percentage group for the game. The game was out of hand so bad that for a lot of the local stations, they basically just cut the game off because they knew the game wasn't uh, in reach. And just looking at all the other AFC teams, really the only two teams that you could make a argument for are Denver and Oakland. But the problems with that is I don't trust Denver's offense as much as I trust New England's, and I don't trust Oakland's defense as, as much as I trust <laughs> New England's defense. Um, so, again, so those two teams can give a run to the Patriots, but I still think that they are clearly the number one team, and everybody else at this point is kind of just fighting for 500, maybe 9-7, and 10-6 and six at best. And so, I guess, sorry for all everybody that may feel I'm just giving... Uh, Doing a lot of credit, but they deserve it. And a shout out to Andrew Warren and Football Chick Seven Nine Four for their team. They are clearly to me the best team in the AFC and argue or to me right now in the NFL. And it, and for the NFC's sake, with how things are going, Dallas got a tremendous win uh, last night against Philadelphia. Uh, Dak Prescott did not look great uh, early in the game, but uh, by the end of it, he was able to make plays. And uh, thanks to the Eagles, a uh, uh, secondary picking themselves off by running into each other. Uh, Jason Witten could not find an easier touchdown pass to catch. But kudos to Dak, though. He's, he's won six straight now. Uh, and he's clearly the quarterback of this team. And I think now, with these two wins, having Philadelphia and Green Bay back-to-back, -back, um, I think he's earned that job permanently. And he should be able to just go throughout the year. He is going to make a mistake. And he made a horrible red zone interception uh, at about, I think, the uh, third quarter of the game. He's going to make those mistakes, but he's earned enough respect and enough tenure, and, and he's just played well enough to earn his job for the rest of the year. Tony should be the backup. Um, and then after Dallas, you know, you had Minnesota. They're playing tonight against Chicago. Again, I'm taking Minnesota minus 5.5 in that game. Uh, they're playing a Chicago team that's just absolutely uh, putrid and pathetic. 
But I, I think Minnesota's in that conversation. I think Atlanta, but their offense, they got a big win. I still don't like their defense, but I, I trust their offense. But you know what? That's funny because I think Atlanta and Seattle and Oakland and Denver are basically the same kind of teams to me. That those four teams, they're contending teams. Again, Atlanta and Seattle have a better shot with Dallas and Minnesota compared to New England with Oakland and Denver. But it just, those four teams, like, I love Oakland's offense. I don't love their defense. In Denver, I love their defense. I don't love their offense as much. But with Atlanta, I love their offense, hate their defense. Seattle, I love their defense, hate their offense right now. So again, both of those teams have strengths. If you could put, again, Seattle's defense on Atlanta's offense, Oakland's offense on Denver's defense, or vice versa, put Denver's defense on Oakland's offense, put Atlanta's offense on Seattle's offense, I think that you could have, you know, the best team to play New England in the Super Bowl for the NFC, or just, you know, to play New England uh, for the Super Bowl. Uh, but again, that's not possible, so, so that's how I feel about that. So those are my, you know, quick thoughts, and I'll go, go through more as I go through my video. But uh, time for my picks, or sorry, before my picks, uh, the bias for this week, uh, the six teams are the Cincinnati Bengals, Washington Redskins, Arizona Cardinals, Houston Texans, New England Patriots, and Chicago Bears all have buys this week. So if you have Andy Dalton, A.J. Green, Tyler Eifert, uh, Hill or Bernard, uh, Carson Palmer, the Cardinals defense, Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown, David Johnson, Brock Osweiler, DeAndre Hopkins, Lamar Miller, the Texans defense, uh, T.J. Federowitz, Brady, Gronk, Bennett, uh, Edelman, Hogan, Blunt, uh, or... I don't know if you, if you have anybody on the Bears. I guess maybe Jeffrey. But if you have any of those guys on your teams, fantasy teams, bench them because they're not going to be playing this week. And I have to bench a few myself uh, because I have a few guys on those teams. So, time for my picks. So, this Thursday, when the 5-3, and three, um, when the 5-3 and three Atlanta Falcons go to the 3-4 and four Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Atlanta Falcons are three-point favorites in this game. I'm going to take Atlanta minus three, along with Atlanta straight up. And then the next game, when the four and three Pittsburgh Steelers go to the three and four Baltimore Ravens, the Baltimore Ravens are actually um, are actually three point favorites in this game. I don't know why, but they are. But I'm going to take Pittsburgh plus three, along with Pittsburgh straight up. Then the next game, when the six and one. Dallas Cowboys go to the 0-8 Cleveland Browns. The Dallas Cowboys are 7-point favorites in this game. I actually like Dallas minus 7, along with Dallas straight up. And in the next game, when the 2-5 Jacks Jacksonville Jaguars go to the 5-2 Kansas City Chiefs. Um, can't, let's see, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Alright, no, anyway. Kansas City is actually amazingly a uh, pick -em in this game, because I haven't seen a spread for it yet, so... Um, I'm actually going to take Kansas City, just pick them, uh, and also Kansas City straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-4 and four New York Jets go to the 3-4 and four Miami Dolphins, the Miami Dolphins are 3.5 point favorites in this game. I like Miami minus 3.5, along with Miami straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-3 and three Philadelphia Eagles go to the 4-3 and three New York Giants, the Eagles are 3 point underdogs in this game. I like Philadelphia plus 3, along with Philadelphia straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-4 four four Detroit Lions go to the 6-1 or 5-2 Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Vikings are 7-point favorites in this game. I like Minnesota minus 7, along with Minnesota straight up. And in the next game, when the 2-5 Carolina Panthers go to the 3-4 Los Angeles Rams, the Panthers are 3-point favorites in this game. I like Carolina minus 3, along with Carolina straight up. And in the next game, when the 3-5 New Orleans Saints go to the 1-6 San Francisco 49ers, the Saints are 3-point favorites. In that game, I like New Orleans minus three, along with New Orleans straight up. And in the next game, when the um, four and four Tennessee Titans go to the three and five San Diego Chargers, the San, the San Diego Chargers are four and a half point underdogs in this game. I like San Diego plus four and a half, but I'm going to take the Titans straight up. And in the next game, when the uh, three and five Indianapolis Colts go to the four and three Green Bay Packers, the Green Bay Packers are seven-point favorites in this game. I like Indianapolis plus seven, but Green Bay straight up. And then in the Sunday night game, when the six and two Denver Broncos go to the six and two Oakland Raiders, uh, the Denver Broncos are one-point underdogs in this game. I like Denver plus one, along with Denver straight up. And then uh, for the Monday night game, when the four and four 
Buffalo Bills go to the 4-2-1 Seattle Seahawks. This is another pick em game. So this is a great thing for me. I'm going to take Seattle uh, against the spread and a pick em, And then, then Seattle straight up. All right, so time for my thoughts on each game. Atlanta at Tampa Bay. Um, so congrats for Atlanta. They beat the Green Bay Packers. It was the first time they beat an NFC North team uh, in the last six tries. Um, but I do want to say this. I do want to congratulate uh, head coach Kyle Shanahan for uh, performing another spectacular uh, game for, the, for his team because the offense had another spectacular performance, another 30-point game. Uh, and Julio Jones only had about 50 yards in the game. So this is, about, this is about Julio going off. And he didn't have Telvin Coleman. And he still put up 30 points. Uh, and again, to put up 33 points, very impressive against the Packers defense. That I know they were struggling, but they were coming right back against the Falcons defense. So good for Matt Ryan and that uh, Falcons team. And, and head coach Kyle Shanahan for uh, being able to perform an excellent, uh, another excellent game. Uh, though I would like to say for uh, defensive coordinator... Dan Quinn and a defensive coordinator, uh, Ron Strong or Ron Lewis. Those two defensive coordinators are going to really need to be evaluated um, before, uh, by the end of the year, because I don't think they're doing their job that well. And I know I just said all that stuff. I know Dan Quinn is the head coach of the Falcons. I was just being satirical because, again, I think Kyle Shanahan deserves about 95% of the credit for what he's done with that offense and how that offense has had to carry that this team to their 5-3 and three record. And Dan Quinn and their other, their other defensive coordinator have done a horrible job in lack of defense uh, for this team to be that good, or to be in this spot. So that's why I said that, to be satirical. So, but again, like I was talking about the offense, Pat Ryan is leading the league in touchdowns and passing yards, and this is the number one offense in terms of yards and points. Though... The defense is still my problem. I, I don't know if people know this, but Atlanta's defense has given up 31-plus points in every one of their home games this year. Every one of their home games, the uh, the opposing teams put up over 30 points. So, again, you can argue about, well, they were lax against San Diego. They had a 17-point lead. They were lax against Carolina. Still, yeah, okay, fair enough. They, they had a lead, but it was bad enough that A, almost in Carolina... If uh, Ricardo Allen doesn't pick a pick six off, you could have had a tie game with Derek Anderson, at quarterback. And B, you did blow the game against the uh, Chargers. You know, so, yeah, you were being lax, but still you gave up 30 points. The only bright spot of that defense has been Vic Beasley, who has uh, third in the league with seven and a half sacks. He is having a great uh, individual year himself, and he's kind of become now the star of that defense, especially on that defensive line. So kudos to him for uh, generating that much pressure and being that effective on the defensive line. Uh, but they are playing a Tampa team that, here was something great that I just found out, right? So, and I'll talk about this with the Oakland game, but I'll just mention it now. Um, Tampa Bay had 270 yards of total offense by themselves. The Raiders had 200 yards of penalties that the, the Bucks accepted. So, if you do the math here, that means that Oakland's penalties were... Let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll find it here. Oakland's penalties were about 74%. Oakland had 74% of what Tampa had in offense and penalties. And what that means overall is that 43% of the Bucks' offense was by the Raiders' penalties. So that's how pathetic this Bucks' offense was that almost half their yardage came off penalties. And they, almost, they, and they almost had a chance to win. Not thanks to their uh, rookie kicker, Roberto Aguayo, who has the worst field goal percentage in the league with 58.3%. And again, he was a second-round pick. Uh, but also, he is the worst, worst rookie field goal kicking percentage for a rookie in Bucks franchise history at this point. Um, and when you look at this Tampa team, Jacquez Rogers hurt his foot. So if he can't go, Martin's having still his hamstring injury. And uh, Charles Sims is on the IR. I don't see this Tampa team having that much... Uh, offense besides Mike Evans, who, by the way, leads all Buccaneer receivers by 304 yards uh, as the leading receiver. And just looking at that equation, I think, look, can Tampa score? Yeah, they, they have Humphreys. They have uh, uh, they have Brait. They have uh, Shepard. They have, I think, Stoker. or St Stocker, who's still there. 
who, who, who can make some plays against his Atlanta defense because everybody can make plays against his Atlanta defense. Um, but I just think it, with Atlanta's offense, they'll be able to outscore and out, outgain this Bucks team. Um, also, it's the first time the Bucks are trying to sweep the Falcons in back-to-back years since 2002-2003. With Atlanta's offense of how confident they've been and the fact that they've been able to close their games like this, I just have enough confidence in the Falcons, who still this year, I've only got one of their games right. I still have enough confidence in that to say that Atlanta's offense can beat up this uh, horrible Tampa Bay secondary in defense and do enough to outshoot the Bucks in a game that you know can be high scoring or definitely can you know be up there in points. But I think Atlanta's offense again overpowers the Bucks defense for another uh, big win. So that's why I like Atlanta minus three. And Atlanta straight up. Next game, Pittsburgh at Baltimore. Um, Antonio Brown uh, still, and this is, uh, if Landry Jones does play, and I will say this right now, that is the only reason why I think we are favored. Because honestly, with the way we've been playing, we do not deserve to be favored in this game against our division rival. We do not deserve it. Um, AB has still not caught a touchdown pass from anybody besides Big Ben. I think Landry's two passes, one was to Hayward Bay, and the other one was to Wheaton. So in, uh, still, AB a- has not caught a touchdown f- from anybody besides Big Ben. And Big Ben is likely not going to play because, from what I've heard, they still don't, they still think he's a few weeks out. Um, the Steelers' offense, though, they've thrown the second most touchdowns in the league. So that's, you know, again, that's impressive that they have definitely an offense that can work. But their defense has been... Uh, not a Steeler defense. Keith Butler hasn't done as good a job as I thought he would by this point. Uh, they have the fifth, fifth worst defense in terms of yards per game, and they allow the fifth most yards per running attempt. Uh, fortunately, though, they are playing a team in the Baltimore Ravens, and also Pittsburgh's trying to avoid a three-game losing streak uh, for the first time since the 2013 season when they started out 0-4. Thankfully, they are playing a Ravens team that absolutely, the last time I saw them, or last time anybody saw them, they couldn't run the ball on anything. They, it was the first loss against the, Ra- the first loss of the Ravens against the Jets in the last eight tries. They played ten games. We had won eight of the last nine. The last time the Jets won was the first time we played them. After that, we won eight straight, and then we just lost to them now. Even though they did something that uh, we did, they had a double-digit deficit in the first half against the Browns like we did, and they were able to come back, so kudos for them for doing that too. So maybe they're, they're at about our level. We don't know. Or maybe that's just how bad the Browns are. Uh, I digress. But but also, the Ravens ran for a franchise low 11 yards. I didn't think that was possible, how we've been trying to run the ball. And I thought we could put at least up more than 11. But when I found that that was the lowest amount in our franchise history, that was a huge problem. So even though Pittsburgh gives up the first, fifth worst, um, or fifth most yards per rush attempt, they're playing a team that just recently hasn't been able to, or just the last time we saw them, could not run the ball. Uh, and also, the Ravens are this team, the first team in NFL history to have their first seven games decided by a touchdown or less in back-to-back seasons, and we are 8-13 and in those games. And we're trying to avoid our first five-game losing streak since 2007, where that year we finished 5-11. and And for me, honestly, like, I'm taking Pittsburgh just because I don't have any confidence in this team right now against, against the Steelers. Landry Jones, right, we've won five of the last six against Pittsburgh. Oh, great. You know, and again, I think this game will be close, just like, you know, all our other games have been the last couple years. Because it's a division game, we can throw the records out the window. So, to me, I just think, again, Pittsburgh has Brown. They have Le'Veon Bell, who's averaged 74.8 yards per game when he's played us. But again, two of the last three times, he hasn't been able to play us. uh, And I think that's going to be a huge factor. And just looking at Pittsburgh, there's just a feeling of, with me right now as a Raven fan, that... We are not going to be able either. We are going to make a mistake that can't close the deal, or we are not going to be able to close the deal ourselves on offense, or Pittsburgh will be able to make one more score in this game. You know, so that, that's what it comes down to me, is that our offensive line's banged up. Flacco has a short, sore shoulder. He hasn't really been able to throw at anybody. Um, our defense won't be able to stop Antonio or Marcus or Hayward Bay. They're going to get uh, Blugarius Green possibly for the first time or for the second time all year. Uh, playing, and he, he should be a big factor. And I just think, again, that, you know, Pittsburgh's angry because we swept them last year with uh, how our team was, 
So I think with that motivation and just knowing that basically, you know, the, the control of the North is on the line, I think Pittsburgh will show up enough where we're going to play like we have the entire year or the last four weeks and say, we're going to get this close to winning, but then we're going to blow it at the end. So, again, it should be a you know, competitive game, hard-nosed, physical game, low scoring. But I'm going to take Pittsburgh here just because I've seen them play, I've seen us play, and I've seen them play, and I just have more trust in their play right now than I, I trust my own team's play. So that's all like Pittsburgh plus three and Pittsburgh straight up. Next game, Cowboys at Browns. This was, <laughs> this was one of the easiest uh, picks of the entire year. Dak Prescott and one of six rookies with a six-game winning streak uh, since the merger, and he's the first one since RG3 did it in 2012. I believe that was when they went from uh, the Redskins were 1.3 and 6. They ended up going 10 and 6 and get, winning the NFC East and uh, losing to Seattle in the playoffs. Um, Ezekiel Elliott uh, also recorded 140-plus scrimmage yards in five straight games. That's the most uh, consecutive games with that mark since Chris Johnson did it from 2009 to 2010 as a member of the Tennessee Titans. And also, here was a little fun stat. Jason Witten, uh, back-to-back years when the, uh, when the Cowboys played their first game on Sunday Night Football at home against a division opponent, he caught the game-winning touchdown in both instances. Uh, I think Romo was about five seconds left uh, in regulation. Uh, last night, it was the first possession in overtime that got the Cowboys that win. And also, I want to congratulate Des Bryant, who had a... Pretty, you know, who had a pretty big game, especially during the end uh, for the Cowboys. He is uh, the first receiver since Bob Hayes for the Cowboys to have three consecutive games against the Eagles when he caught 100 plus yards. And uh, I want to give Dak his credit that it was not the most efficient game by Dak Prescott, but if you look at the yardage numbers and the three touchdowns and what he did and how he played during the end, he pushed the ball down the field and he made some big throws and some big, big plays of his feet and his arm that Carson Wentz, who looked like the bigger version of Alex Smith, or check down Charlie, where he just threw like two or three yards of play, Dak, you know, Dak showed a lot more in that moment. And again, you can argue about Wentz, that was play calling, sure, but Dak Prescott showed that he had the ability to make and extend for the big play, unlike Carson, who, again, looked like the epitome of the check down Charlie quarterback. Um, I digress, but I'll talk about the Eagles game in a second. Um... And with all that being said, they're playing the worst team in the league. Uh, Josh McCown, though, he threw for 228 yards in the first half. That is the most passing yards for the Browns since uh, Kosar's 275, 275 yards and a half in 1986 against the Dolphins. Uh, and I think they're the only team in the NFL, and somebody could put in the comment section if I was wrong or I misstated. it, uh, the only team in the NFL to blow two 13-plus point leads at home <laughs> at the end of the half tw- uh, twice this year. You know what, they're the only team to do that uh, more than once, where they had a double-digit lead going into the second half, and they blew it. Um, this is the first 0-8 start they've had since being relocated back to Cleveland, and this is the worst start they've had uh, since 1975, when they also were 0-8. Um, the Dallas Cowboys are trying to win seven straight for the first time since 1993, and Dallas won three straight games overall. This is the best team in the NFC compared to the worst team in the NFL. Not much more has to be said. If they lose to Cleveland, or that's the thing, it would take a heck of a collapse. Or, you know, again, even if, like, Mark Sanchez, I think Mark Sanchez, if Dak went out, they didn't want to put Tony in, Mark Sanchez could get them a win over the Browns. That's how little confidence I have in the Browns right now. That Dak Prescott could get hurt, and they still could beat the Browns. So, again, with all that being said, one of the best teams in the NFL, my... My best team in the NFC against the worst team in the NFL. That's why you take Dallas minus seven and Dallas straight up. Um, next game, Jacksonville, Kansas City. <sighs> Jacksonville, what a, you know, where Oakland has been rising and they're six and two and Derek Carr has looked spectacular and he's an MVP candidate and his Raiders team has won, you know, five and all on the road and, the, you know, they're six and, they're six and two. Two, their best start since 2001. Uh, the Jags and their quarterback who came out of that same draft class and a team that had kind of the same amount of weapons, the same kind of talent, totally the opposite way. Uh, Blake Bortles and the Jags looked absolutely horrendous on Thursday Night Football. Another clunker for TNF. Uh, Blake Bortles now falls to 0-10 when he's thrown for 300-plus yards. So think about that. If he throws for 300 yards, you basically lose. 
which is kind of sad because you would think that there would be one game at this point, and that is the worst record, by the way, of any quarterback with that many games where he's thrown for over 300 yards. Um, but there is one thing I will give Blake Bortles. He is the king of garbage time. Uh, over the last three years, he's thrown 26 TDs in the fourth quarter when trailing by 10-plus points. That is the most in the NFL during the last three seasons. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, so that's the thing. Blake Bortles, his numbers look a lot better by the end of the game, but a lot of those numbers and number numbers and touchdowns and yards really don't care, and it really did not matter. Matt Castle was put in in the mid-third quarter of the game, so that's how much that tells you that the uh, Titans really cared about the game or knew that the game was basically theirs. Um, and also, the Jacksonville offense was pathetic in the first half. The Titans put up 354 yards in the Jags defense. The Jaguars only put up 60 yards of offense in the first half this past Thursday. So, this Jacksonville team right now, Gus Bradley sh should be fired by the end of the year. I don't think he will, even though they fired offensive coordinator Greg Olson and they've replaced him with quarterback coach Nathaniel Hackert. I don't know how that's going to change things because... He's been working with Blake Bortles, and he's seen him in practice. So now that he gets the call plays, I don't exactly know how that's going to change things. But it's time for a big change in Jacksonville because this team is way too has too much has too many pieces, you know, to not be this bad, and to possibly get for the sixth year in a row a top five draft pick, which would be an NFL record. Uh, so, and they're not going to win this week because they're playing the consistent Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, who are after the bye? They are three and zero, and they've been averaging twenty seven point seven points per game. They put on a spectacular performance against the Indianapolis Colts. And mind you, this was about a uh, Jamal Charles, and then Spencer Ware went out of the game. Alex Smith got knocked out of the game twice, and Nick Foles, who went sixteen to twenty two, two hundred twenty three yards, two TDs, and no interceptions, he played he played he played an efficient game. And he looked like, for the first time in a long time, the Nick Foles of either the combination of Andy Reid and Chip Kelly of how effective he was. He was able to make some you know, decent throws, and he was able to carry that team through the rest of that game. And I think with just how bad Jacksonville's defense is, I think if Alex Smith can't go, Nick Foles can step in with that team around him and beat a struggling Jags team. And watch out for the Chiefs. Again, here's another great thing. Since uh, Week 7 of last year, uh... The best record in the NFL belongs to the Kansas City Chiefs. They are 15-2. and two. Um, And also, I do want to give some love to uh, one of their wide receivers, Tyreek Hill, who actually, if, if nobody knew this, he actually leads a team with four receiving touchdowns. Um, so when you look at this game, right, I, I think, again, Blake Bortles will, fi will have an opportunity to uh, put, pad his garbage time stats. He'll be the garbage time king once again because I think this Chief team, who has been absolutely spectacular, they have found their rhythm. They are a sneaky team that nobody really wants to talk about because they don't have Derek Carr and Cooper. They're not putting up 500 yards of total offense from their quarterback. They're not, you know, they're not that flashy or that dramatic. The Chiefs are just consistently going every week, here's our plan, let's execute it to the best ability. We'll run the ball effectively. Smith and Foles can make effective throws, maybe an occasional deep throw, but we'll manage the game, control the clock, and our defense can, you know, generate pressure and, you know, hold offenses enough to win games consistently. And I think they're fine just being under the radar. Um, and the last two times these two teams have played each other over the years, uh, the last two times it was 70-22 to 22 with the minor scores. Or se the combined score was 70-22. to 22. So with that being said, Kansas City just overall is the more disciplined team, better talent. Um, and I think with Blake Bortles now having a new offensive coordinator, he's going to struggle even more or just about the same. And if he plays like he has been, that's not going to lead it to a victory against this very good and consistent Chief team. So that's why Kansas City, and that's why I'm surprised to pick them. I like Kansas City with a pick them against the spread and Kansas City straight up. Next game, Jets and Dolphins. Now congrats to the Jets. Now they've won four straight games against Cleveland. You know, that's something positive. And the Jets actually, over the last uh, two games, against the Ravens and the Browns, against the AFC North, they've outscored their opponents 34-8 to in the second half. So they've really been able to, you know gain some confidence and put, you know, two good games together. And the NFL, that's all it takes to just, you know, roll momentum together into a consistent feeling. And also, the Jets made history. That, this is the first win in their franchise history when they trailed by 13-plus points at the half. They had, they had, that's happened 71 other times. They lost all 71 other occasions. So, congrats, Jets fans. So shout-out to Logan Schiff. 
you have a positive stat and a positive feeling about the Jets, you know, going into today. And kudos for winning back-to-back games. You're feeling a little bit better. And also, I want to congratulate Quincy Anunwa, um for a career-high 81 uh, rushing yards. Uh, or, I'm sorry, career-high uh, receiving yards. 81 receiving yards and a touchdown. Um, of course, Miami is coming off the bye. And th- their big story has been uh, the emergence of former, four, I think, former fourth-round pick uh, last year out of Boise State, running back Jay Ajayi, and I believe I said that correctly, who uh, who became, uh, against the Bills, the fourth running back with 200-plus yards in consecutive games, uh, joining O.J. Simpson, Earl Campbell, and the last uh, running back to do it was uh, Ricky Williams when he was a Dolphin, and Ricky Williams. Uh, and here's how crazy it's been. Jay Ajayi's, Jay Ajayi, 59% of his total yards came in the last two games. His career total yards, over 60% of those total yards, have come in the last two games. Um, and to me, I, I look at it and say that when... I, I, I look at how the series has gone, I believe the... Uh, let's see... I believe the uh, Dolphins have lost four last five to the Jets. Um, but with just this team, I, I just have trust in Miami that they've been able to run the ball. They should be able to run the ball better against uh, the Jets' defense than how we did. Um, because I think Ajayi has enough power and enough size to him that he can get, you know, get through holes better and just run with power and speed. And I, I think with that, again, Terrell Pryor had a spectacular game against uh, Darrell Revis. He got over 100 yards. I think Jarvis Landry has the ability to be just as effective. Um, and I think, again, they, they'll be able to... The Dolphins' uh, defensive line can get pressure on Fitzpatrick. And Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's looked like the efficient Ryan Fitzpatrick, not the great Fitzpatrick, but the good enough Fitzpatrick to win, I think he's going to look more like the bad Fitzpatrick against his Dolphins' defense, which has been playing extremely well. They've been getting pressure on uh, you know quarterbacks over the last couple weeks they've been which have caused mistakes and we know one thing Ryan Fitzpatrick can have throws that uh you can consider mistakes um the game should be close I you know I wouldn't be surprised if the Jets win it's a division game throw the records out the window the Jets I think have a better you know receiving core than the Dolphins do um but just overall I just think Miami's they found a consistent rhythm and they're rested and I think going into this Jets game where the Jets had to, you know, fight back against the Browns team. And I guess the Dolphins had a tough game against the Browns too. So, um, I just have faith in Miami with Ajayi that he can put up another solid game and Tannehill will be more efficient than uh, Fitzpatrick. And that'll be enough for the Dolphins to win this game. So that's all like Miami minus three and a half and Miami straight up. Next game, Eagles at Giants. Um, th- th- uh, last week in London, it was the first game for the Giants of four turnovers caused. Uh, since week six and seven of last year, and I think they split those games. They went one and one in those games. But here is the problem with the Giants. That offense has been absolutely uh, horrid, and it should not be with how much talent they have. Okay, if you, even a running back, because every Giant running back this year has less than 150 yards through seven games. No running back has been able to separate himself, and they're not even doing that well. They don't even have really a running game that you want to think about. They haven't been able to run the ball at all. Um, and again, like I said, the Giants have, are 20, uh, the 26th ranked offense in points per game. And when you have Eli Manning, a two-time Super Bowl winner, you know, consistent, you know, started has been there every game. You have Odell Beckham. You have Victor Cruz. You have Sterling Shepard. You have Donnell. You have Ty. You have a good enough offense that you should not be that this bad or that inept offensively. Um... And it's also the first 10, uh, where for the Eagles, right, they suffered their first 10-point blown lead uh, since week 10 of last year when they were up 16-3 to on the Miami Dolphins. They ended up losing that game, I believe, 20-19 to uh, in week 10. But this Eagles defense is played spectacularly well against the Giants. They have won five of the last six games against the Giants. And overall this year for defense, they have allowed the fifth fewest passing yards the eighth few, and the eighth fewest total yards on defense. Um, I look at this game and say that, say that, look, the Eagles at home have been way better than they've looked on the road. 
And Carson Wentz, like I said, he looked like check down Charlie. Um, so, again, I, I, I need him to do a little bit more than that to feel confident. But honestly, Eli Manning, where where I might think that Wentz might play like check down Charlie, I don't expect Eli Manning to play that ball at all. He, he'll look like uh, Crazy Charlie or... Uh, yeah, yeah, crazy Charlie. That you know he'll he'll you know with that pr- that defensive line with how much pressure they can generate, with how much pressure they got on Dak Prescott, I can see Eli Manning just throwing balls errantly. You know, in the last several games against them, he hasn't looked that well. Uh, it was twenty-seven nothing and like twenty-seven seven the last two years. You know, I know that's in Philly, and in the Giants games they they've been closer. But I don't think it's going to be that high of a shootout because the Eagles' defense is way better than it's been the last two years. But I just think, again, the Eagles have an offense that I can trust enough against this Giants team to say, okay, Carson Wentz can play his game. He can be effective. He can, you know, throw 15 yards or fewer. And by the way, his longest pass of the night, last night, was 14 yards. So that is the epitome of check down Charlie (laughs) for Carson Wentz that he would throw bubble screens and stick routes and the occasional slant that went up, you know, 14 yards. But I think that's enough going up against the Giants team that they haven't been able to get that much of a pass rush. Not that many tar- – well, they had four turnovers against Keenum, but I don't think Carson Wentz is going to be that bad. And I just Philadelphia's defense to make enough mistakes or cause enough pressure that Eli Manning won't be able to even uh, reach Wentz's ability – or Wentz's ability against the Giants defense. And I think – Wentz and the Eagles can slide through because I don't think the Giants can, if they get a lead, be able to come back and win the game. It should be a fun game. It's Eagles-Giants, New York-Philly, always a fun rivalry. But I'm going with the Eagles here because I trust the defense more against the uh, against the uh, Giants offensive line. And I think Carson Wentz will play a better efficient game than Eli Manning will, and that'll be the difference. So that's why I like Philadelphia to beat the Giants. Vikings over Lions... The Detroit Lions scored the fewest amount of points this year on offense. Uh, the, uh, yesterday against the Tech. They only put up 13 points. And the thing with Detroit is this. I don't know who they are. Detroit's had big wins. They've had, you know, all four of their wins, they came back from the fourth quarter. But then you put up duds against the Bears. You put up a dud against the Houston Texans. Because Brock Osweiler and the Houston offense... Did not look that good at all. Lamar Miller only ran for 56 yards. Osweiler threw for 180 yards. And you still couldn't beat him. And that's the thing. I just don't know who Detroit is. You know, Detroit could give Minnesota a run for their money. Detroit could, you know, lay another egg. And that's... But that's why I'm thinking Minnesota. Minnesota, for the most part, besides against Philadelphia, they have been consistently showing that they are going to play spectacular defense that I don't think the Lions offense will be able to uh, handle. And Sam Bradford will play effective football. Uh, It was the lowest offensive total last time the Vikings played um, until tonight. They've had the entire year against Philadelphia. And Sam Bradford had a career-high four fumbles in a game against the Eagles defense. He was able to pick one up, but he lost three of them. But this is the best defense in terms of points, yards, and turnovers forced. Um... And it's, but, again, the, the issue is the Lions defense is not bad. This is the second worst offensive yards per game and the lowest amount of rushing yards per game and the fifth fewest passing yards per attempt in the NFL, uh, which is the Vikings offense. But with just the Lions, I don't know who you're going to get every week. They have shown that they can play spectacular games, have big comebacks, or lay eggs. And I think against this Vikings defense, they're in for an egg. Because the Vikings, the one thing I can say is even though I don't love their offense and I'm still not a big Sam Bradford fan, every single week, basically, besides the game against Philly, they've been able to play really good defensive football and consistent football that can get them victories to put them in a spot to contend for the Super Bowl. And this Lions team, I just think, again, they're 8-8, eight 9-7 eight, at best. So that's why I like Minnesota minus 7, uh, but Minnesota straight up. Uh, Panthers and Rams. Congrats to the Panthers. They snapped a four-game losing streak overall on a two-game home losing streak. And it's also the Panthers, for the first time all year, they led by 24-plus points in a game. The last time they did it was against the Cardinals in the NFC Championship game. 
Oh, and by the way, uh, Arizona, you may not want to like to hear this. The last three times you played the Cardinals, uh, you have been. Uh, I'm sorry, the Cardinals. The last time you, the last three times you played the Panthers, you have been outscored 106 to 51. Um, and again, I, I think it was a game where. Ke- uh, congrats also for Thomas Davis, first career touchdown for him off the fumble by Carson Palmer. And also, I, I wanted to mention, say something real quick about Cam Newton. Cam Newton was talking about um, the hits that he hasn't been able to get called. I, I will say this, that he's mi- the refs have missed some blatant uh, roughing the passer or quarterback hits, and he should get credit. But I just heard that there, there have been more quarterbacks that actually have had less penalties uh, called against him. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to try to say, you know, you know, people might say, oh, oh, it's a race. It's not that. I just think it's something where, look, Cam Newton deserves to get more calls, but when you look at it that way, I think every quarterback and every officiating crew deserve, you know, deserves blame on basically every quarterback this year who hasn't gotten a roughing the passer call that should have been called. Um, so, so again, Cam has a point, but in grand scheme of the entire NFL, you know what? Every quarterback deserves that too. Um, and a- every quarterback probably doesn't feel safe when they're out there. Or any player, really, because in any second, the NFL stands for not for long. You can be out there at any time. Um, so, all right, those, those are my quick thoughts on that. But this Rams team is just going back to the Rams that we all thought they were. Um, Case Keenum threw a career-high four interceptions against the Giants in London. And the last one was a fair catch punt. That's how bad of a throw it was. Um, and also in back-to-back games, Case Keenum threw the last, on the last offensive play for the game, he threw the interception that ended the game. Uh, so, and also I think another big problem is Todd Gurley has dissipated. It's not really his fault, but again, if he's, you know, the 10th pick in the draft, he should be able to, you know, break through some of those double teams and, you know, make his own holes uh, to run through the offensive line. He, he does not have a 100-yard rushing game in his career, or this year. And I think his first four games, he had over 100 yards uh, by that point anyway. And also a quick little uh, infamy blame for Jeff Fisher. He's become the third coach in NFL history of 160 losses. The other two coaches, I believe, that over 160 losses are Tom Landry and uh, Dan Reeves. And I think he's five losses away from tying Dan Reeves' record for most losses in a career and six away from breaking it. And while this team's playing right now, I think he can do it. <laughs> um, and the Panthers have won five of the last six games against the Rams. Uh, this is a big trip for, for the Panthers. They have to travel all the way up to L.A. now. So that will be a big thing for them. But I, I like the Panthers here just because they showed some life. And honestly, of how bad the Rams have been, I'll trust Cam Newton and this Panthers team to have found some life. Jonathan Stewart had a big game, 90, uh, 85 rushing yards, two TDs. You know, pretty solid game by him. I'll trust that Panther team in this moment against the Rams team that are really struggling right now and have free fall and just kind of like the Ravens into a point of no return. And I think with the Panthers, knowing how this division is and just kind of how they are, they gained some confidence. And that's what the Panthers needed just to maybe get on a roll. And this Rams team, the perfect one of the perfect teams to play in that kind of feeling. So that's what like Carolina minus three and Carolina straight up. Next game, New Orleans and San Francisco. I like New Orleans here. I do want to congratulate Drew Brees. 58 straight home game with a passing touchdown. That is an NFL record. And also, the Saints defense held the Seattle offense to the lowest amount of points they've held this, this year at home. And the second lowest amount of points at home in the Superdome over the last three years. The lowest amount of points they've held uh, an opponent at home over the last three years was, I believe, the uh, Teddy Bridgewater's first start against the Minnesota Vikings. They won that game 20-9. to nine. And over the last three years, uh, yeah, that's the second lowest amount of points uh, they've held an opponent in the Superdome. I know they did it last year as well against the Dallas Cowboys in Week 4. I believe they won that game 26-20. So kudos for the Saints defense for showing up. And actually, for the most part, over the last uh, couple weeks, they've been playing better. And don't look like the worst defense. Or don't look like Oakland's defense or... Other defenses. Um, and also, I'm going to congratulate the New Orleans offense. On five of the last six drives of the game, New Orleans was able to score on Seattle's defense, which was the difference in the game. And kudos for Will Lutz for making those four clutch field goals. Um, uh, let's see. And even if 
the defense still didn't look that good, I would still take New Orleans anyway because they are playing the Niners who have the worst defense in points per game and they have the worst offense in yards per game. So this is, um, besides the Browns, the worst team in the league. They haven't even uh, looked good. Kaepernick doesn't, you know, Kaepernick hasn't made the difference between him and Gabbard. This has just been an absolute dumpster fire and just another horrible year and another horrible experiment for Chip Kelly. I think, again, you could argue you could fire Chip Kelly. They fired Jim Tom Sula after one year. They're probably not going to do that to Kelly because Chip Kelly's a bigger name than Jim Tom Sula. But I'm taking the Saints here because the Saints defense has showed up the last couple weeks. And even with that, I know that New Orleans can score. New Orleans can put points on anybody. And if it had to go to a shootout and Kaepernick somehow found his rhythm, I'll trust Drew Brees against the Niners defense more so than Kaepernick right now with this team against the Saints defense. Could be an interesting game. I think New Orleans defense against San Francisco, we lost all hope. They could put another defensive game together. And also they won revenge for the 2011 game in San Francisco where their defense blew, uh, you know, gave up a touchdown of about 40 seconds left uh, to uh, Vernon Davis from Alex Smith. They got the Niners to the uh, 2011 NFC title game. But I, I like the Saints here just because I've seen their defense have a little bit of heart. And I know one thing, the Saints can score and the Niners can't. So even if it goes in a shootout, the Saints can score uh, more points than the Niners can. So that's why like New Orleans over San Francisco. Tennessee over San Diego. Um, congrats for uh, Marcus Mariota. Four straight games with two or more passing touchdowns. That is the longest consecutive streak uh, for a Titan quarterback since I believe Kerry Collins did it back in 2009 or 2010. Um, also, DeMarco Murray, congrats to him. Uh, DeMarco Murray has already ran for more rushing yards uh, right now than he did last year combined. So congrats for DeMarco Murray on having a career uh, resurgence. And he looks like the running back we saw in Dallas. And the offensive lines are playing well. Derrick Henry had a uh, solid form. Sorry, guys. I know it was a little stuffy. Um, but um, that I feel that with uh, with DeMarco Murray, that he's had a career renaissance. Derrick Henry looked pretty solid. And it's been the best start for the Titans since 2011. That year they ended up 9-7. And I think at 9-7 and seven with this division, they could end up winning the division. Um, and also, here's another fun thing. Uh, just another, another bad thing about the Jaguars. The Titans have won three game, home games over the last two years. Two of them have been against the Jags. The other one was against the Browns, which happened a couple weeks ago. So, good for Tennessee for winning another home game. I guess for their sake. Um, the Broncos defense uh, pressured Phillip Rivers. The highest percentage on dropbacks in the league this year. I think it was 61%. So when Phillip Rivers is under duress, he is showing that he has not played well. And he th had his first three interception game of, the, of, of his career for the first time since week 16 of the 2014 season. Uh, San Diego is a lot like Baltimore. Over the last couple of years, they dealt with a lot of injuries. Think about it. Uh, Keenan Allen's out. Danny Woodhead out. Manti Teo out. Uh, I think Casey Hayward's been out there. Some of their tackles have been out. Antonio Gates has been out. Uh, Jason Barrett's been out for parts of the 20s. And for them, they are 5-14 in one-score games since last year. They've had 19 games come within a one-score range. Um, even though San Diego's won nine of the last ten games against the Titans, there's just something about this Tennessee team. And again, the last time they played each other, that was the last time the Titans won. I just like how Tennessee's built. They're the only team in the NFL, shout out to Keith Bailey, to have a top 10 offense and a top 10 defense. And I think with the San Diego team, they're going to put up a fight. And that's like San Diego plus four and a half because I think this could be a three-point game. And San Diego, if Tennessee stays around, if Tennessee lets them hang, hang around long enough, they could win the game. But I like, I like San Diego plus four and a half, but Tennessee straight up just because I trust Tennessee as a whole team in a sense of they can, you know, they've been able to close out games. The, the Chargers, for the most part, haven't been able to. And I think it's something where Tennessee, they're confident now, and there's a different vibe to this Titans team, unlike other Titans team in the past, knowing that they not only feel that they can compete against these kind of teams or these kind of games, but they can win these kind of games, especially a game in a stadium like San Diego where it'll be warmer, and San Diego's really not known for being that loud or being that energetic towards uh, uh, their own home fan base. Uh, it should be an interesting game, but I'm taking the Titans here just because Titans have had more complete team, and I've seen them close out more games and look 
more consistent than what I've seen the uh, San Diego Chargers look. So that's all like San Diego plus four and a half and Tennessee straight up. Next game, Indianapolis at Green Bay. Andrew Lux on he's to get sacked 62 times this year. He leads the NFL with 31 sack, or he's been sacked 31 times, which leads the NFL. Um, let's see. Uh, I do want to congratulate uh, Trevor Davis and Geronimo Allen, uh, who caught two TDs from Aaron Rodgers. Before yesterday, they hadn't even thrown, he hadn't even thrown a pass to them uh, until yesterday. And just for retrospect, Jordy Nelson has 52 more regular season touchdowns than those three guys combined. And the other guy was Jeff Janis. So Jeff Janis, uh, Ger- uh, Geronimo Allison, and uh, Trevor Davis would still have to catch over 50 touchdowns to tie Jordy Nelson. So that so those are how much of a no-name those three guys were. Even though Jeff Janis, he made that big play against the Cardinals. So I think maybe some people knew him or kind of remembered. Well, they'll watch the play and go, he was the guy that caught the ball. But I digress. But... And also, I, I, I want to give the uh, uh, Packers defense some credit. They pretty much shut down the Atlanta rushing game pretty well. They uh, allow the second fewest rushing yards, and uh, and they also have the fewest uh, rush. Yeah, they've allowed the fewest rushing yards uh, the Packers defense has, and uh, the second low fewest. Uh, yards per play as well uh, by the Packers defense uh, through the ground. And Indianapolis really can't run the ball. They've had one 100-yard rusher in the last like three or four years. So, even though the teams have split the last six games, I'm going to take Indianapolis plus seven because I feel like this is going to be a shootout, especially with Green Bay's lack of corner depth. But I think Green Bay still wins because they're at home and with how bad the Colts defense looked, I think Devontae Adams, Randall Cobb, and Nelson, and Montgomery, if he can be healthy, and the other guys I just mentioned, they can get open on this Colts defense because everybody's basically been op- able to get open and have big plays against this terrible Indianapolis defense. And uh, shout out to shout out to Poet Rider. Sorry for Andrew Luck's uh, you know team because they are like you said wasting his career away. So that's why I like uh, Indianapolis plus seven, but Green Bay straight up. Next game, the Sunday night game, the Broncos and Raiders. Denver has scored the most points off turnovers in the league. I think it's like 70, 75. I think 75, 80 points off of turnovers by the opposing team. That's the most in the NFL. And that's how they've been able to win games a lot. And I also want to say real quickly, prayers to defensive coordinator Wade Phillips. He uh, got collided with by, I think, Travis Benjamin. He went down for a while, but last time I heard, he was out of the hospital and he's all his uh, vitals were there and he was able to move his arms and legs. So good for them. Good for him. And I wish him a speedy recovery. And hopefully uh, this Sunday night, when the, or he can travel with the team to Oakland uh, to uh, participate in the game. Um, and Trevor Simeon, you know what? Uh, the last three games, he hasn't played great. He hasn't played good, but he's played well enough. Or well, He's played well enough. 56.6% completion, 663 yards, three TDs, one interception. Not bad. And again, at this point, again, he's completed about 61% of his passes. ATDs, four interceptions. You know, not the greatest offensive line, not the greatest of running back situations. Simeon's done pretty well to keep this team at a 6-2 and two spot. <laughs> Where with the Raiders, um, you have Amari Cooper. Congrats, he had a career high in receiving yards. He actually got a, his career high in receiving yards in one half. He had 161 yards at the end of the half, which was the most in his career anyway. So, um, Also, the Raiders are 5-0 and on the road for the first time since 1986. Um, though this was the most undisciplined game in NFL history, like I said, they committed an NFL record 23 penalties, 23 except the penalties for 200 yards. There were, I think, four or five other penalties that the Bucks declined. Um, and I'll say it again. When I look at this team, here is what I think of this game. It's not about the Raiders offense going against the Broncos defense. It's about the Broncos offense going against the Raiders defense. And here are the numbers to put it. Denver's passing offense, 28th. Uh, in passing yards, 27th. Total yards, 20th. Uh, I'm sorry, 28th in passing yards, 27th in total yards, 20th in rushing yards. That's Denver's 
offense. The Raiders defense, 22nd in points allowed, 31st in yards allowed, 27th in passing yards allowed, and 28th in rushing yards allowed. So that's the battle that, you're, that you want to watch to watch this game. Like I said, if you could put the Raiders offense on the Broncos team or the Broncos defense on the Raiders team, you would have clearly the second best team in the NFL or the one team that New England would have to play in the AFC that would provide a threat. Um... But I'm going to take Denver here because Oakland hasn't won that many games at home. Denver, I believe, hasn't lost a game in Oakland since 2010. And I just trust Denver's defense to make a few more plays and to be more disciplined than I expect the Raiders' defense to do on the Broncos' offense. Should be an exciting game. This is the game of the week. I am so excited about this game because these are two evenly matched teams in the division. And this game means a lot for the uh, playoff picture and the AFC West. And I'm going to take Denver here because I think Denver will be more disciplined. And I trust their defense to make one or two more stops or make one or two more plays compared to the Raiders' deep, um, uh, offense going against the Broncos' defense and the Raiders' defense being able to stop the Broncos' offense and stay disciplined. All right, so that's what I'm taking the Broncos over the Raiders. And finally, Seattle over Buffalo. This is really tough. Uh, Buffalo now falls to 3-26 and against uh, New England with Brady now all time. So, uh, four Bills fans. Um, and also, Tyrod Taylor had a 26-yard rushing touchdown on fourth down. That is the longest touchdown run, or the longest rush on fourth down since John Kitten had a 29-yard rushing touchdown for the Cowboys in week 11 of 2010 season. Um, Russell Wilson. I am a huge Russell Wilson fan, but this has been definitely his worst year as a pro and definitely his worst year since his second year in the league. Uh, three straight games about a passing touchdown. That is, that is, he is the first CL quarterback to do that since Matt Hasselbeck did it in 2001. Uh, he, he's looked absolutely anemic. He's definitely missed some throws. He's not as accurate. He, I don't think he feels confident in his leg as much as he did in the past. And uh, also the defense has been wore out. Uh, Seattle's uh, offense, an hour, 22 minutes, and 33 seconds over the last two games, the defense has been on the field. They've lost the time of possession bad. Uh, and Seattle and Buffalo has split the last four games. But I'll put it this way. If McCoy can't go, they I think the Seattle offense can find enough to stop this Bills team. You know, at home. I think if this was in Buffalo, I, I might have taken the Bills to win. But if they don't have McCoy, I think that offense can do enough to win this game. Just enough. Um, to win. And that's why it's a pick em, and I can understand that. And that's what like Seattle just did a pick them and straight up. So those are my thoughts on all my picks this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Uh, best of luck to all players, coaches, teams, fantasy players, and fellow prognosticators. Shout out to Keith Bailey. Shout out to the Water Boy, uh, Poet Rider, Half Moon's Picks, Logan Schiff, um, Geo Nose, Hatbox, uh, First and Dante. Uh, Philadelphia, and a lot of great other prognosticators, Bridgewater's finest, um, and uh, best of luck to them as well. And until then, until next week, this is Matthew and Fanatic signing off. Everybody enjoyed the games, and uh, happy Halloween as well for everybody, and be safe. And until next time, so long.